So, uh, like I mentioned, this is going to be a little bit of a different dispatch than you guys normally see. Normally, this would be a, a written piece about uh, current events or a sociopolitical topic that we can either do a, a little bit of a deep dive on or, or, or kind of explain where things are coming from and, um, you know, talk about some topics that uh, you don't hear in, uh, in corporate mainstream media and usually with the dispatches or sometimes at the end of the di after the dispatch i tend to to rant about uh, a particular t uh, topic or, or just something that has been bothering me you, you know in the in the twitter sphere or something just uh and and i you know put those up you guys know that but uh recently i've been talking a lot more about what's going on with critical race theory uh, that 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 was something that just kind of popped up. Um, I, I don't think it just randomly popped up. It's it, it popped up for me, I should say. It popped up for me. Um, wasn't particularly something that I was paying a whole lot of attention to until it became this huge controversial issue for conservatives, uh, centrists, and people on the right. You know, those are those are the people that I'm seeing uh, that are really really distraught with this notion of critical race theory. And there, there seems to be a lot of misinformation that is uh, fed to people. And uh, last week, if you if you listen to the dispatch episode last week, I talked about a very frustrating and um, a little bit of a troubling interaction that I had uh, with a friend of mine. You know, this guy's this guy's a centrist. He kind of said some things that were like, "Come on, man!" Like this is. But you know, I I pulled back on the discussion because it was very evident. Um, that this individual wasn't particularly looking for a discussion. This individual wasn't particularly looking for a conversation, but rather looking to someone from the left to validate their beliefs. And they weren't really looking for a counter uh, perspective or a counter viewpoint to, to what they already had set in their minds. And I would wager to bet that the folks that we're about to look at now are kind of in that same category. They're not looking for... Um, a debate of, of sorts. They're not looking for any sort of constructive conversation. They are looking for, you have to believe what I believe in um, because what you're saying is, is so terrible. So, again, just a little bit of a recap of what's going on. If you haven't paid attention to the live streams, if you haven't gone back and listened to some of the other rants that I've done um, on this podcast, specifically talking about critical race theory, let's do a little bit of a recap of what what you know what it is, what's going on, and why these people are, are are reacting the way that they are, and then we'll break down some of the comments and 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 part of this is yes, it's catharsis, right? I, I the the negative shitty comments that you get as a content creator or as a stand up or anybody in in the public light. Uh, is exhausting, and you can sit there and go back and forth nonstop in the comment sections. But what are you doing essentially? Is um, you know, to me, it's just not a valuable use of time. Um, in the comment sections, there is anonymity. You know, a lot of people really don't know who you are, where you're from, what your beliefs are, and the and and it's it's a little bit of a myopic view. So it's just it's just not a constructive. Uh, medium to have these sort of discussions. So for me, I'm going to kind of break down what what is wrong with the comments uh, that I'm receiving on this topic. So critical race theory basically is um, the accurate history, the the real depiction of of the racist history of America, right? Um, what needs to be taught, and and some people have been taught this in their public schools. Other people haven't. Um, but, but what needs to be taught is that the Puritans and the Quakers that came to America uh, were colonizers. That's what they were. They were kicked out of their country, sent to this one, um, and they were colonizers. They, uh, they, they brutalized the indigenous people of this uh, of this land, they stole land from the indigenous. There was a lot of, you know, and and the way that I was taught, and and from having conversations with people, the way that a lot of other people were taught, is that the natives were the bad guys in this, right? They were, they weren't people that were trying to protect their land and protect their culture and protect their people, and rather than trying to, um, you know, the the framework isn't that they were trying to protect their 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 livelihoods but rather uh try to destroy this new way of life which is also not true they weren't really trying to attack 
the Puritans, I think the Puritans could have made some, you know, really productive deals with, with the natives in the land, learned from the natives in the land. I mean, a lot of settlers died because they didn't know how to work the land. They didn't know how to deal with the winters that, uh, that, that this side w was seeing and turned to cannibalism and, and things of that sort. You know, and, and the natives could have very, ha would have very happily taught them how to survive in the winter. You know, what are some tactics you can do? And there could have been some coexistence. But instead, again, what you see is this Anglo-Saxon, um, Judeo-Christian, primarily white, primarily Caucasian uh, co colonizers coming in saying, we know better. Um, so we're going to we're going to just take over this land and 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 look to these indigenous people and turn them subservient. That's the that's that's the actual perspective. That's the actual history and truth about what what happened, which then let you know what, what if you have invaders in your land, what are you going to do? You're going to fight back. You're going to you're going to defend yourself. But again, the perspective is not taught as the natives and the indigenous people we're defending themselves and we're defending their homes. Same thing with slavery. And we'll go through some of the details of what some of these comments say about about that topic specifically because there there is some crazy shit that people say about that. Um you know, in America I, I mean slavery slavery was happening on a global scale and it was primarily uh the slave trade was established again by European colonizers from not just the, not just England, uh, but also France and 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 Belgium and Germany and f Spain and Portugal. Like these guys were also colonizers that went down into Africa and decided to participate in the slave trade. Um, and you know, uh, and and particularly in America, it became a a point where people were people were exploiting these slaves, brutalizing them, and a lot of what we see in America in, in modern day is rooted in the way that, you know, America used and brutalized slaves. What do I mean by that? Well, we know that uh, American policing originated in slave patrols, right? Uh, you know, the, the uh, middle to lower class um, you know, middle to lower working class white males primarily needed money. And if they weren't able to earn enough money, these very rich plantation owners would hire them to go and get uh, runaway slaves, escape slaves. So they were they were like slave patrols and they would hire them to make sure that their their slaves wouldn't run away. And that's what evolved into modern day policing. Um, and again, the origins of that are, are well documented. There's a lot of evidence to support that. I've done va various videos on my channels talking specifically about modern day slavery um, and how, how the American policing system kind of upholds that system of modern day slavery. A lot of historical documentation to prove that, right? This, this goes back to the Carolinas in the 1700s and it just kept escalating and escalating and escalating. So... You know, when we see police brutality where uh, people of color and minorities all, you know, what have you, they're, they're all being brutalized by the cops. These neighborhoods are being patrolled by uh, people that don't live in their community, that don't know the dynamics of their community, that don't understand uh, the economic hardships that these people have to go through and why, the, why they make the decisions that they do. That all goes back to, um, that all goes back to those slave patrols. And you have to also remember that these plantation owners didn't look at, at black slaves and even their white indentured counterparts um, as actual people. Now, the white indentured counterparts were treated much better and were given a little bit of a stipend. Uh, but in all essence, they were they were also like in the servitude to the 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 rich plantation owners, but they gave them preference on, on racial lines by saying, well, the black people are not as good as you or, 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 or aren't on this echelon as you are. So we're going to pay you a little bit. We're going to give you access to some land. And it's a way that they kept 
uh, you know, the black slaves and the white indentured servants kind of separated because if they got together, they would realize that their struggle is against the same person. Um, and, and they would, they would have, you know, a revolt would have happened much sooner. And there were, uh, there were some, uh, 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 periods in time, uh, between the 16 and 1800s where that did happen. The white indentured servants, uh, got together with the black slaves and there was some uprisings, right? But it was quelled very quickly. Again, the slave patrols were involved with that. The military was involved in that. The, you know, they, they got, they got assistance from the King to send some of the military over to, to quell these uprisings. And, uh, and then in order, again, in order to kind of split them apart, they gave the white indentured servants pieces of land they paid them a little bit just to keep them quiet just to keep them from from revolting and just to keep them away from uh black slaves who they have more in common with so uh the black slaves are, are not treated as people what they look at black slaves as were property so you can go back again to say that the slave patrol which which in which is what modern american policing comes out of was not protecting people they were protecting rich people's property and again you can see that happening again look at the critical infrastructure laws that we have across this country uh they are not meant to protect people they are meant to protect things like pipelines construction equipment telecom towers so on and so forth again there's another video that i did last year that itemizes what uh, ALEC, which is this Koch-funded legis uh, legislative lobby, uh, what they consider to be, quote, critical infrastructure. And it, and it is things like pipelines, fossil fuel companies, uh, telecom towers, so on and so forth. And there's a long list, and I talk about that long list in, in, in this video I released about a year ago. Um, but that's that's what they're doing. And the cops come out and they attack the protesters and they attack uh, and they and they're protecting property. It's the same thing with the Black Lives Matter movement. They attack the people, but they protect the property. Right. And and again, in in most instances, I would say about 90 percent of the instances where there's a peaceful protest uh, happening, the cops show up and they escalate the violence. Right. If there are people holding signs, drink, you know, drinking water, and they're marching and they're chanting, why do you, and they're completely unarmed? Why do you need uh, cops showing up in riot gear, dressed like they're ready to go into a combat scenario uh, in a war zone, um, and then you know let them use quote less than lethal rounds, which are not less than lethal because when you fire a projectile at several hundred meters per second at anything, it's going to do damage. Um, that's just, uh, that's just physics, right? Um, that's just a law of science. Uh, so it's not less than lethal, especially, you know, if you're firing projectiles at several hundred meters per second at another human being. Uh, we, and we've seen that. We've seen evidence of how people are hurt by these, quote, less than lethal rounds. And the only reason why they call them less than lethal rounds is because it doesn't kill people, but it maims them. Uh, some people have lost sight. Uh, some people have broken bones. Some people have, like, injuries that don't heal properly because of the way that they're hit. You know, it does damage. It does long-lasting damage. So why? So what does this have to do with critical race theory? Well, all of this stuff that I'm, I'm talking about is an aspect of how race, the historic racism that is in America has affected this. So you look at the way that the things happened in the past and you look at the way that things are happening now and if there's very close similarities, then we haven't really progressed in that department. Now, the argument that a lot of people make is, well, we have progressed in terms of race, right? People are sitting in restaurants together. Uh, black pe there, there's, there's no more segregation. You know, we have black people that are able to vote. And I would say, yes, okay, that is some kind of progress, but this is all basic human rights that should have been granted to people in the beginning. When, when American con the American Constitution was formed, they should have realized the hypocrisy of saying, all men are created equal, but we're still going to have slaves. And we're still going to treat black people uh, like they're three-fifths of a, of a person. And we're not really going to let women do anything. And by the way, if you're poor and can't own land, then you can't really... So, you know, that's the hypocrisy we're calling out with this critical race theory. 
you can teach things like how even after the Civil War, uh, there were a lot of instances of racism. The KKK was propped up. The KKK was actually, uh, you know, had had uh, uh, people in politics. I did a stand-up bit about Indiana's KKK governor, which the only reason he was uh, impeached out of office was because of nepotism. Not because he was a member of the KKK and wanted to put in racist laws in Indiana. Not because of that, but because he, ha because he you know, committed fraud via nepotism. Which is ridiculous, right? And again, you look at somebody like Jeff Sessions that goes, oh, the KKK is a great organization. My only problem is that they smoke weed. That's what makes them bad. It's like, no, really? Not the vehement racism? Not thinking that one group of people is far superior to another group of people? That Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions was okay with. That's all part of the racist history in America. So, you know, I, I covered the fact that uh, rich white people in, in Virginia threw a temper tantrum. Now, if that was any, any person of color that threw that kind of a, that kind of a tantrum, that, that extreme of a reaction, the cops would have arrested them, tear gassed them, shot them with rubber bullets, kettled them, and put them in prison. Right? For rioting. White people do it, and they got talked to a little bit. That's kind of the only thing that happened. They, you know, like the sheriff's department was like, look, guys, you can't do this. The school board's made its decision. You guys all have to go home. And they still didn't go home. And it's like, this is what we're talking about. Look at the difference when white people riot versus black people peacefully protesting it gets called a riot or, or even white people supporting black people's peacefully protesting. It gets called a riot. The cops get involved. The cops come in riot gear. Whereas in this instance, the cops didn't show up in riot gear. They were in their uniforms. They were talking people down. You don't see that in black neighborhoods. You don't see that when it's a, when it's a, a, a peaceful march or a peaceful protest, uh, trying to t uh, shed light on the, on the racist, institutional racism that exists within our system. That in and of itself should show you the inequality and the racism in America, right? And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to show, that this kind of stuff does exist. So, so that's one. So the other thing, too, is as a pushback to this, as a pushback to this, Texas recently came out. And this is where a majority of the comments that we're about to look at are from. Um, Texas came out and and is now trying to make it not required teaching to talk about MLK, the civil rights movement, even things as far as uh, slavery, um, at women's suffrage, uh, the you know the I bet you anything that remotely even looks as uh, uh, looks socialist, like they're not going to teach you that it was the labor movement that got you the eight-hour workday, your weekend, got rid of child labor laws. They're going to try to uplift it as well. Look at this very benevolent rich person that did that for you. You know. And, and that, that's kind of the way that it's taught now. I don't remember, I don't remember learning about uh, labor leaders like Mother Jones or Eugene Debs or the international workers of the world. I do remember people like Andrew Carnegie being championed as, you know, um, these heroes of the working class. Uh, and, you know, that the people that striked against him just didn't understand. They just didn't understand. And again... A lot of people also have this misrepresentation that um, unionization and strikes and these labor movements are not for people of color when that's completely false. Uh, in fact, the international workers of the world back in the, in the uh, 1910s and 1920s uh, were advocating for um, you know, people to come together, trying to create a rainbow coalition, something that Fred Hampton later carried on and, and actually was starting to become successful in, which is why he was assassinated. But in the in the in the 1910s and 20s, the international workers of the world were calling for that. And they were basically saying that, look, if if um, if immigrants and women 
and uh, minorities and black people don't have the same rights as white people do, then we are failing as a society. We're not doing the right thing. We're not uplifting democracy. We're not uplifting uh, equality. We're not, we're, not talking, we're not doing what this country was supposedly built on. The AFL, on the other hand, wanted it to be predominantly for white male tradesmen. And they said, if you're not a white male tradesman, then we don't want anything to do with you. Hence, kind of splitting the movement, uh, not really doing much to help the working class, so on and so forth. And they, they were kind of called out for, for that, kind of, that kind of bullshit. But that's not how they teach things, right? And again, this is all important. Now, one of the things I mentioned is they're trying to teach this to the kids in the third grade. And like I said, I, I was in third and fourth grade and I learned about Nazis. Uh, I was also experiencing vehement amounts of racism because it, I, was the only, I was the only minority in my class for a long time. You know, it was like me and a couple of the other Indian kids and a couple of the other Arab kids uh, at my school. And we were the minority. Like we were the diversity in our school. You know, I didn't I didn't really have black kids at my school for a very long time. I really didn't. So it wasn't until much later did I start understanding that perspective. Um, but yeah, you know, I, 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 I experienced racism. So my argument to that of like, oh, you can't teach eight year olds racism. That's so crazy. Like these kids can't experience that sort of, wait a minute so it's okay for them to experience racism but not you you can't teach it to them you can't teach them what it is and where it comes from i think an eight nine ten year old very much can understand uh that there was a point in history and 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 this point in history um has changed a little bit not you know th things things are a little bit different things are a little bit better but there was a point th there was a point in history and there's still points in history where people are judged based on the color of their skin or what country they're from, and there are stereotypes that the that that a lot of people uh, put on them and and make them into a monolith and so on and so forth. Right? You can teach them that, and you can and you can even ask them and say, "Do you think that's right? Do you think that a person should be judged by the color of their skin based on racial stereotypes? Is that something that you think is okay?" And they'll probably give you an honest answer. And you can teach them, well, you know, this is, this is what people say. This is what people don't. That's critical thinking. That's showing them, hey, you know, judging people based on the color of their skin doesn't, is not great. It's the content of their character, how they live their lives. You know, do they help people? Are they putting profit over humanity? You know, how can we build a system that's better? So teaching kids that, white, black, brown, what have you, whatever gender it is, maybe they'll look at that and go, you know, human history has not been particularly kind to people that aren't predominantly white and male. Perhaps we should start working on a system and on, a, on an economic system and a government system that doesn't do stuff like that. And then as they get older, you can introduce different concepts, different theories, different points of history, right? By the time you're in high school, you should learn about the Tulsa Race Massacre. You should learn about the move bombing. You should learn about what happened to the Black Panthers, along with MLK, Malcolm X, and the rest, and the Jim Crow laws and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you should, you know, Rosa Parks and all that sort of stuff. This should be taught in tandem. So by the time you get out of high school, you should be aware of that history. I was not. I was not. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot of you guys weren't either. So this is the sort of stuff that I talked about um, and kind of pointed out how, like, you know, this, this level of indoctrination in education where you are systemically erasing various portions of American history... Uh, is pretty toxic, and that's how you lead to a 1984 level dystopia, right? We never, we ne I, I know I've said this before, but I'm gonna keep saying it till it sticks. We ne we have not seen the way we get to a 1984. They talk about some of the ways that we got to a 1984, but we never really see it. We're living in the prequel to 1984. 
you know, criminalizing socialism, the way that, that the Biden administration is, the way that Texas and people are freaking out about teaching the actual, true, factual history of America being steeped in racism. You know, the real history of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The Republican Party actually comes from kind of socialist principles. Anti-racist socialist principles is what was the foundation of the of the Republican Party when, when Lincoln was in charge of it. And even when Grant was in charge of it. There were several, I, I believe there were eight or nine black Republicans that were in Congress from southern states. They were actually actively going out and removing factions of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. It was only until William McKinley came in and, 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 and realized that there is, there is money to be made um, that he kind of made the party into the party of private industry. And, and the Democrats were always a party of private industry. And capitalism needs slavery in order to work, so they just figured out a different way to do it. Deregulating uh, corporations, saying that corporations are people, things like that really helped capitalism reinforce the notion of slavery and use slavery in other parts of the world where, where that was a little bit more acceptable because they didn't have a civil war to fight. Uh, they didn't have abolitionists in their country, maybe. And, and America going in and doing that sort of stuff validates those countries' use of, of, of slave labor. So in turn, America found another way to, using capitalism, America found another way to, uh, you know, continue using slave labor. That, that all, you, you should know that. And I think high school kids and college kids for sure have the mental wherewithal to learn that kind of stuff. And that's the future of, of, of this country, right? Those, that's what we say. Kids are the future. So they should learn all this so they can stop making the same mistakes that our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents made. So I did all this. I talked about all this. And uh, here are some of the comments that, uh, that I got. So let's, let's take a look at this. So the first comment I got was... Uh, you know, basically said, holy shit, you have mental problems. That was the first comment I got. Um, and that was around my rant to, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the very disheartening conversation I had with my friend. Um, and, you know, the answer to that is, no, I don't think they're mental problems. I think they're, you know, everybody has their, their issues that they deal with, anxiety, depression, so on and so forth, and you learn how to handle that yourself. And, and that was, and this is part of the way that I deal with it, is, is I do these rants, I do, I, 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 I do these shows, um, things like that, that, that kind of help me talk through some of this stuff, that kind of help me work through some of this, some of this stuff, right? Uh, and that's 100% okay. I think that's what, if that's what you need, then that's what you need. Um, but I don't know if, if advocating to learn the actual history of America, which is steeped in racism, is, 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 a, is, is a mental problem. Then the second comment comes from my uh, video from uh, talking about Texas, trying to, you know, uh, remove MLK and all of that is required teaching. And it just starts with propaganda. That's how I read it whenever I see it. Because there's three, it's all caps, three exclamation points. Propaganda. Public schools have no right to teach any form of religion, especially CRT. Public schools are for teaching science. Anything else is indoctrination. You are evil as fuck. Wake up. So first of all, I do agree that public schools shouldn't be teaching any form of religion unless they're teaching religion in a historical context, right? Um, I think teaching religion in a historical context is important. Um, that's a great way to introduce uh, religious philosophy, what people taught, what, what people thought versus what was, you know, actually, what was, what, what the religion actually talks about. Uh, I think that's fine. But to call critical race theory a religion is just objectively false. It's not a religion. Uh, it, is, it is teaching the actual history of racism in America. 
It's teaching how it's institutionalized and systemic in this country. It's teaching how the economic system that is very prevalent in America uses racism and uses aspects of racism to benefit the rich and wealthy. I mean, look at Tulsa. That's what happened in Tulsa, right? Uh, Black Wall Street, the neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa was thriving. Uh, Black Americans in Tulsa were doing better than poor white Americans in Tulsa. And that was because the oil barons that were there that were hiring white people, and, and they were hiring some black people too, and they were paying black people not a great amount of money. But they were paying white people an okay amount of money. But they were taking most of the wealth for themselves, and, in, and, and once they realized that, like, the idea of Black Wall Street was spreading and white people were going, what the fuck? What is this? And, and you know, they were realizing that a lot of black people have this deep sense of solidarity for their community. And instead of learning what that, that sense of solidarity is, um, you know, the, the rich white oligarchs in that area said, hey, you know, Black Wall Street has your wealth. The reason why you're poor is because Black Wall Street is rich. You should go do something about it. And people were like, yeah. And and the second they found an excuse, right, uh, basically what happened was there was a young man who was a, a, a shoe shiner in, in Tulsa, went up to use the bathroom in the one black bathroom that they have in downtown Tulsa at that time. Uh, you know, something happened. They claimed that he sexually assaulted a, a woman um, was was called into questioning, taken into the sheriff's department, and over some gossip that he raped this woman, uh, these people went down and essentially massacred the entire neighborhood of, of Greenwood in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and, then, and then they were all proud of it, right? The New York Times was covering it, and all these rich white people were like, look how well we did. And then basically when the rest of the country was like, what the fuck? Are you guys serious? This is what you guys did? When it was like, oh, our racism isn't looked at as something to be championed because we essentially destroyed this thriving neighborhood on a rumor because it came out, it, you know, it came out that this black kid didn't do anything to this white lady in the elevator. Charges get dropped. Public perception was very negative. So what did they do? They got rid of all the stories that involved the Tulsa race massacre. Literally got, like, erased it. They erased it. That's not a religion. That's history, man. You can't say history is a fucking religion. It's just ridiculous for you to say that. You know, public schools are for teaching science. And here's the thing, man. Public schools are for teaching science. Anything else is indoctrination. So is math indoctrination? Because you need to learn math in order to learn science. Okay, so you got to learn math. So you're not saying math is indoctrination. What about history? Critical thinking? What about language? What about grammar? Are those indoctrination? Because apparently public schools can only teach you science which involves some math. So some math is okay, but not all math. Art, creativity, are those indoctrination? That's interesting because historically what, you know, this individual claims that history is indoctrination. Historically speaking, artists have challenged positions of power. Art, art, art has been a vehicle for creative thought and creative problem solving. Or rather critical thought and creative problem solving. But all of this apparently makes me evil as fuck. Evil, according to this individual, is championing equality and true democracy in this country. Is looking at a way of life such as socialism and saying this has more tenets of equality than capitalism does. Like I said, the international workers of the world were like, hey... We have to cross racial barriers. You know, all genders, all races, all ethnicities, we're fighting for you guys. This includes white people and all that stuff too. There, there's more inclusivity in socialism than in capitalism. Capitalism, the way it's structured, the hierarchies in capitalism show inequality. 
the the person working, you know, doing the the factory job, putting stuff together is just as important in socialism as the manager that works on logistics, as the owner that works on making deals. All of these people have different roles that are equally important in the success of a, a particular company. And you can apply that to a societal level, too. So everybody should kind of be paid as if they're equals, because they're equals. In capitalism, the person that does the manual labor, despite the fact that that manual labor is very important, because without that manual labor, this company doesn't have a product, is treated less than the manager who is working on logistics and transportation. And that manager is less than the CEO who's, you know, in, in American capitalism does virtually nothing. That hierarchy in and of itself shows inequality. But championing for, if you champion for that inequality, you're the good guy. Championing for equality for everybody so that everybody is, you know, plays a part in society and has a purpose. Because a lot of human beings are just looking for purpose, but having that makes you evil, according to this person. That's a real warped, warped philosophical sense of what good and evil is. So this next uh, next couple, well, I think this next two, there's only four slides. Um, so slide two, this is slide two. This is where things get a little kooky with this person, and that's the politest way that I can put it. Oh, uh, I should mention that Indie, Indie Left News, if, you, if you're not familiar with Indie Left News, please go follow Indie Left News, IND Left News, did try to respond to this person by saying CRT includes the factual history of how African Americans were treated in this country. Schools are for teaching history too, otherwise it's bound to repeat itself. Kudos! <laughs> Kudos for that comment. Uh, thank you for, for responding to this. And I'm glad that you didn't engage this person any further because it, because it is very clear that we're dealing with somebody that um, has very warped belief systems and, and might might be a little unstable, right? So, so when you're talking about this subject, like I, I mentioned this yesterday, part of why I want to do this is so that, you, so that, so that people that are, are championing critical race theory, are championing to learn the actual history of this country, to realize how racist it is, to realize how, uh, you know, we haven't lived in this fucking utopia just because uh, it's America and we say freedom all the time. Um, those people are, are, are not, th like, this individual is not interested in having a debate. This individual is very much interested in holding on to their traditional viewpoints and belief systems. And look, I don't know any, I, I don't, I don't know a lot about this person other than what they've commented. Uh, I don't know how old they are. I don't know how, um, you know, what the, what their job is. I don't know what their experiences are and so on and so forth. But based on what they're saying, it doesn't sound like they're particularly a, a stable individual. Um, and when you kind of meet the people like that, and when you realize that, you can try to help them a little bit. But in, but really, the, they, they have a lot of work to do on themselves. Um, and I don't think they see themselves as unstable. And I don't think they see what they're saying as particularly bad. And, and part of this, too, is, is, what, is especially based on this next two comments, they're, they're going to use sort of this pseudo-academic language. That makes them sound smart, and it's what and this is the kind of stuff that centrists kind of veer into and and gravitate to, right? They kind of look at the academic aspects of racism and they put they they parrot and pull into that. So I want to show you what these people say and kind of how to counter some of this stuff. So this is what the we'll read the whole comment and then we'll kind of break it down just like we did the, for the last one, right? Uh, CRT is not history, touching on historical topics, does not validate racist fallacy. History is a myth. The victors write history. The only argument you have to de defend this is, quote, accepted history, which is supported by evidence, which also disproves everything CRT is. And then it's this weird quote. It says 80% of millionaires in the USA today uh, come from lower middle class or below families. 
There are more whites living in poverty than black. The only identity of the people that do not have special privileges in the U.S. USA is the straight white male. There is no systemic oppression of POCs. Parentheses hate that term. Uh, if you truly want to make the world better, following corporate propaganda will not help. Processing all the data is the only way to see the answers to the problems. Okay, so let's break this down. CRT is not history, and touching historical topics does not validate racist fallacy. I actually don't. I, I've read this sentence several different times, and I'm I'm actually not sure what the fuck that means because I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they're both counter to to themselves. Like that first sentence in and of itself is very contradictory to itself. Sta one part of the statement c counters the other part of the statement, right? And this is where things get a little crazy. <coughs> Excuse me. History is a myth, which is just objectively false. The victors write history, and that's true, right? And what we are taught in our public schools is the perspective of the victors, or what we perceive to be the victors. I, I, I would say it's what we perceive to be the victors because when it comes to the labor movement, they actually won, right? The fact that we have an eight-hour workday, uh, the fact that we have weekends, the fact that we don't have child labor, that's the, that's the socialists winning. That's what that is. And but the way that it's taught because of the perception of victory is that that the capitalists are the ones that granted this bounty upon the, the, the plebes of the world. But that's not true. We are the ones that won. And 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 then going forward, all they did was one, they, you know, wrote this perceptive victory, um, you know, this perceived victory. And they wrote the history according to that. And then they use their legislation, Taft-Hartley, to depower unions, to depower co collective bargaining, and depower the working class. And then they use other laws, such as part-time work, removing ben tying, tying you know, certain benefits to, to employment, to full-time employment, which the company does not need to guarantee anybody. And they circumvented... The socialist wins. So then they use that as a point of propaganda to say, see, socialists didn't actually win. So I would go on to say that, yes, the victors write history, but it's also the perceived victors that write the history. And then he goes on to say the only argument you have is that this is, quote, accepted history, which is supported by evidence. Uh, evidence of what? Because there's a lot of evidence to the contrary for this, quote, accepted history and i just presented some of that the iww marched in the streets they led protests they led strikes they led, led led organized movements to help us win and he claims he claims this proves everything crt is which it doesn't again that's false because your second statement is false uh 80 of the millionaires in in the usa today come from lower middle class or below families uh, basically saying, you know, poor people are, are, are make up 80% of millionaires. Let's say that's true. I don't know what source this individual is is getting this from because they didn't really cite the source. Um, if that is true, how do you think they became millionaires? Was it through the loopholes and cheats in the capitalist system? Was it through stomping on their friends and family? Was it through shady business practices and immoral and unethical business deals? Because that's how these people become millionaires and hundred millionaires and billionaires. They have to give up an aspect of humanity in order to achieve that. That rugged individualism, the reason why it doesn't work is because it's fundamentally not a part of human nature. We are a cooperative animal. We work in community groups. We've always worked in community groups. That's how we thrive. So hyper-individualism, where one person, the CEO of a corporation, is given all the credit and all the wealth, is, is opposite to what human nature is. And, and psychologically, you know, psychology professors basically come out and said, yeah, you know what, billionaires aren't, 
they can't relate to being a human person because they don't have to go through the struggles and anything like that. Uh, you know, the struggles of survival that we have to. So they can't really understand what that means, which makes them not human. They don't understand what it means to be human because they don't have to go through the same things that that the rest of us go through to be human. Psychologically, they can't perceive that. That's why they, they let go aspects of compassion. That's why they let go the aspects of morality and ethics. There are more whites living in poverty than blacks. Uh, numerically, probably. Statistically, percentage-wise, you know, I would wager to bet that it's probably more even than you think, statistically. Uh, but I would say that it skews more towards the black and brown people stuck in poverty. It's a lot harder for black and brown people to get out of poverty than for white Americans. Uh, and I say that because, you know, Lee Camp has, has talked about this in his stand-up where, uh, you know, you can't get a good, decent job if you're, if you're, e e even if you have a, a black-sounding name. And, and because of racial stereotypes, like I'm, I'm, I'm Indian, which means everybody expects me to be a doctor or an IT person. Now, I went to school for graphic design. I was the only Indian kid in my graphic design program. There were two black kids in my graphic design program. I believe one of them is still doing graphic design. I'm not sure if the if if the other gentleman is 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 in in the design world. Um you know. But we're not encouraged to go into those fields. Black people aren't encouraged to become designers. So how, so if that is a semi decent lucrative industry Black people aren't encouraged to go into STEM. Women aren't encouraged to go into STEM. We have to do it in defiance. Just like we did, just like, you know, black people in this country had to do in the 30s and 40s. When it came to sports. I mean, how many times do we champion this notion of the first black engineer, the first black baseball player, the first woman astronaut? It's And the reason why that, that, that is, is because these people aren't championed to go into these fields. They're not encouraged to go into this field. So how can they pull themselves out of poverty when they have a limited, um, you know, stereotypically they are limited into what jobs they can and can't go into. And when they do go into a different field... Everybody kind of looks at them weird and is like, eh, you don't look like the, per you don't look like us. We all, this is what we all look like. And you don't look like that. And we're just, eh, eh, eh. So certain programs have then to be introduced, like affirmative action, in order to encourage black people and women and brown people to look into other careers out of stereotype. And what do the racists do? What do people like this individual do? Oh, well, the blacks, are, blacks and the browns and the women are coming for my job. No, we're just participating in this. And if you are, if you are a champion of capitalism, then you champion competition. So shouldn't you be competitive with people from all races and genders? Isn't that what makes capitalism so great? Interesting that hypocrisy exists. And that goes into the next state, and, I mean, and, and that just proves the next statement wrong. The only identity of people that do not have special privileges in the USA is straight white males. When is equality a fucking special privilege, you prick? It's not. Asking for equality is not a special privilege. It just should be a thing. That's why when that's why when people come up to I mean I have friends that come up to me and they go well you know black people can sit in the same restaurant as white people now and they can do this and, and it's like yeah so we're giving props to for basic human rights you want a pat on the back for up like for basic human rights There is no systemic oppression of the POC. I just described how there's systemic oppression of POCs. 
And then he goes on to say that, you know, following corporate propaganda won't help. Was What is corporate propaganda? Do you really think critical race theory is corporate propaganda? Why? Because some fucking general decided to say, say that, you know, the military should learn critical race theory? That's why you say it's corporate? Eh... That's corporations glomming. That, that's a corporate entity glomming on to a, a something that needs to happen. You want to know why critical race theory is, is being talked about right now? Is because last year we saw the resurgence of uh, the civil rights movement for my generation. Because we're sick and tired of cops murdering black and brown people in the streets without any sort of uh, penalty. You want to talk about indoctrination, bro? You ha- th- this is all this is all championed by corporations. Corporations love this kind of shit. They love the whole let's use academics to justify racism and say some wild ass shit. But just because you sound academic, it all makes sense. This is the next comment, right? Uh, 80% of the African slave trade went to Central and South America, the Spanish. Over 90% of the African slave trade was sold by Africans. Every race was enslaved in the USA. At the end of slavery in 1895, there were over 3,000 black slave owners. Slavery was not racist. It, is, it was how all the people of, of every race in the country lived at the time. The USA led the way to ending slavery. Mm. Uh, CRT is in direct opposition to the words of MLK, false. CRT is racism. It segregates and classifies people by race. CRT is the classism required by fascism. False. Classism is required by fascism, and classism is the classism required by fascism. Uh, So all of this is wrong. I I don't know if 80% of the African slave trade went to Central and South America. I haven't found any evidence to prove that. Uh, And yes, there were prominent African people selling their own people out. This happened in India, too, when the British showed up. People that wanted to enrich themselves sold, literally sold out their own people by selling human beings as property. Uh, Every race was enslaved in the USA. That is uh, pretty accurate. Guess who enslaved most of these races? I'll give you a hint. It's corporate fucking rations. It's corporations. Mining towns were essentially the resurgence of slavery. They paid people in scripts. They, uh, they, they split up the camps based on what ethnicity you were in. So they segregated the camps so that they couldn't talk to each other. And, and, and unionized together. That, and so they tied red bandanas around them so they knew that they were you know, part of this thing. That's where the term redneck comes from. 3,000 black slave owners uh, at the end of 1865. Eh, well, they were, would have been former black slave owners, wouldn't they? And then the claim that slavery is not racist because every country did it is just a false justification. It is the stupidest justification I've ever heard. It was fine for that time. Well, no, it wasn't fine for that time. That's why, it, that's why people were fighting it. That's why people were trying to escape. That's why people were champion were, were, were abolitionists. Because it wasn't fine for that time. You had an entire movement that led to the Civil War that you're ignoring with that statement. That's not a justification. It was a different time. Yeah, well, it wasn't great for that time either because there were people protesting it during that fucking time. The USA led the way in ending slavery. No, they didn't. They just realized that it's not economically viable. That no that that people don't want to deal with us deal, doing this shit. But they found other countries that are okay with 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 slavery that don't have labor laws, and they circumvented it. And then they invented things like mining towns to 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 bring slavery back. They paid them in fake money. Miners were paid in scripts, fake money, and if you were caught with actual American currency, you were like you were you were you know punished for it. That's part of this history. That's how you brought slavery back. 
in the early 1900s, just 30, 40 years after the Civil War. Corporations that were owned by white dudes were looking to bring slavery back. So how can you claim they led the way to end slavery when they were looking for new ways to implement fucking slavery? You can't, because it's objectively wrong. Saying CRT is in direct opposition with the words of MLK, which ones? You're not really providing any evidence to which words of MLK. Are you picking specific words out of context? Because everything CRT is, is exactly what MLK was talking about. Because CRT, critical race theory, shows how race is, is intersectional to various different things. Martin Luther King Jr. was a socialist. He was anti-war and tried to uplift poor people of every race, creed, and color and gender. CRT teaches you what the past was and how it's affected the present so our future can be better. And you're claiming all this, all this false bullshit. And then you're claiming it's racism. And, and we'll get into why this statement is being said, okay? Why that statement's being said. CRT is classism, but classism isn't classism. Capitalism thrives on classism, and that's why it leads to fascism. We're heading in that direction now. And then this is, this is why people consider CRT to be racism, right? They go, anti-whiteism should not be taught to children. The only, pe the, the only people who want to harm white children by teaching them uh, only of the sins of their people are anti-white. Stop lying and spreading anti-whiteism. Whiteism. I'm not spreading anti-whiteism. History is doing that for you. And plenty of white people have tried to change that. Uh, and the reason why... Uh, you know, you, you, you're claiming that uh, kids are being taught the sins of their people uh, are, are caused by white people is because you don't teach socialism. You don't teach the history, uh, the, the history of the labor movement. Racism and, and, you know, white people doing evil shit comes out of capitalism. White people doing good things comes out of socialism. Just actually, you know what? I'm going to cancel that statement and just say anybody doing anything good to uplift the working class and, 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 and stand for equality and justice comes from socialism, not capitalism. Here's the, other, here's the second comment, right? You're being disingenuous. You're an anti-white, and people need to know that telling white kids they spirit murder all black and brown kids is not teaching civil rights. And then they link to some MSNBC uh, or MSN fucking article uh, about some Fox News reporter and I was like this is not I'm not going to read that and I didn't read it because it's probably a whole bunch of corporate propagandistic bullshit uh, and it's going to be wrong and it's just going to piss me off uh, but this notion of spirit murder that's not what we're telling white kids we're telling white kids that there is a history of systemic oppression um, that that benefits you because of the color of your skin something that nobody chooses and you know you, you have a choice. What, you can either continue to participate um, and uplift that, that system, or you can learn what the system did, how it operated, and how it oppressed people, and do something different and better. Dis, dismantle that system and build something new and better. That's what critical race theory talks about. That's what the civil rights era was talking about. Building a better system. And that's the real fear that these people have. That's the real fear that these people have. This is an anti-whiteism. I'm going to use... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and use, use a fucking phrase uh, that, that all racists that talk about anti-whiteism uh, always say to prove that they're not racist. I have plenty of white friends. And if you're going to sit there and fucking get shitty about that, then stop saying I'm not racist because I have black friends or I have brown friends. If you're not going to accept that statement for me to counter your anti quote anti whiteism, then stop fucking saying that to try to get out of, you know, people calling you a fucking racist.
this isn't teaching white kids that there's they spirit murder or that uh, the only thing that they've done is commit a bunch of sins. Accepting that you have committed a bunch of sins and that you can you can be the change and teaching teaching them examples of movements and people that have led to try to build a better future is important and that's what critical race theory is is, is teaching kids. And I'm I'm 32, so I'm I'm saying like 18, 19 year olds are kids too. So this is the kind of shit that you get when you address this stuff. But the real fear comes out of the fact that if if we if we actually have equality on all levels, including on a racial level, it means that people like this, who I'm assuming are probably white dudes, especially the person that left these these two large comments here, I would assume are white dudes. I don't again, I don't know. I'm just basing it off of the off of the comments that I've received. You know, I don't know your personal history and so on and so forth. I don't know that sort of stuff. But based on these comments, you know, I can I can uh, make make some kind of an assumption that you're probably a white dude. It means it becomes that you're quote less special. That's what they're afraid of. Your your automatic positions where where you don't have to worry whether your name is or 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 something that you believe in is going to, you know, ensure that you don't get a job or ensure that you don't become a part of an organization or whatever or that the color of your skin is going to get you killed or the color of your skin is going to get you fucked up com uh you know, comments like this. You don't have to worry about that as a white kid. And all of a sudden, black and brown people coming up to a point where they also don't have to worry whether the color of their skin means that they do or don't get a job or get comments like this or get shot in the street by cops is somehow a bad thing because now you don't, you don't get to be as special as, as you thought you were, as the system propped you up to be. And once we get past these racial barriers, then it does become a conversation about classism and how race was used to divide the classes, right? Again, let's go back to this. There are more whites living in poverty than blacks. Then why are the white people and the black people in poverty not joining together and, and hitting the streets? Why aren't the, why aren't the white people that aren't in poverty helping the white people that are in poverty. I think Jeff Bezos is doing that. No. Jeff Bezos is oppressing both white and black people and then and then, you know, using race as a point of div point of divide. Oh, we can't give you a raise cuz you know the black guy, you know, affirmative action, they wanted more money, so we had to give it to them because of government. No, that's not true. Everybody can get paid a very very good wage. To live and be comfortable and, and, and to be able to afford recreation in their lives. Statements and comments like this. I mean, the toxicity in, in statements and comments like this. But, but, you know, trying to engage them in the comment section is worthless. It really is. It really is. I hate to say that, but it really is. Um, because you saw that. You saw Indie Left News trying to have a rational discussion, and then you got two large, kind of crazy, and I apologize, I'm, I'm sorry for using that term, but I don't, I don't, I can't really think of any other descriptor. Unstable, maybe? You know, unstable con comments. And then you get comments of, well, you're anti-white. No. I'm not anti-white. But you can make a recognition that there has been a lot of shitty things done by white people in positions of power in this country. 
that created a system that would benefit them and them alone. And they, and they, and they utilized the philosophies and the economic principles of capitalism to oppress the, the, the rest of the people. And then in order to make sure that the rest of the people don't band together, they use things like race, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation to split everybody up. Nobody can do anything about that unless they learn that. And that's why it's important to learn things like critical race theory. Which, honestly, you know, critical race theory just sounds scary to these people because of the words that they use and the order that they use them. If we just say this is the factual history of America, the people's history of America, the true history of America, would they really have that much of a problem? No, they probably would not have... have but the focus being on race is they take it personally and they say, well, you're, you're, you're disenfranchising me and my experiences and the things that I've gone through. No, we're pointing out the systemic problems that you get to be a part of and you have somewhat benefited from. But these people don't want to learn that stuff because then they're going to have to face the ugliness surrounding their race unfortunately if you don't want these things to be a reality learn why it's a reality and then work to change it because when you learn why it's a reality you also see the people that have been trying to fight this system and the tools and tactics they use and you get to learn what worked within those tools and tactics and what didn't work within those tools and tactics To deny that is just foolish. It's just foolish. So that's, you know, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Thank you for uh, checking this out. If you enjoyed this dispatch, please do hit the likes button. Please do share this out with as many people as you possibly can. And, uh, you know, if you see crazy comments like this, try to engage them. But once you kind of see that they are veering down this unstable path, just let it go. Um, but do, do share this around because I do think that this is important, especially if you have, um, you know, centrist and liberal friends that are against teaching the actual history of America or are unable to accept the actual history of America. Uh, maybe this conversation will help them see, you know, hey, um, I am kind of supporting these unstable converse, uh, these unstable comments and these people that are that are saying very hypocritical things and that don't really make a lot of sense. So so, you know, make sure that you share that sort of stuff. Uh, I want to let you guys know about some awesome live stand up comedy shows that are coming back. That's right, folks. Live events are coming back, which is very exciting. Uh, August 14th, I will be at the Irma Freeman Center for Imagination in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On September 17th, I'm going to be at the Art House Projects in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. On September 30th, I'm going to be in Louisville, Kentucky at the Bardstown Lounge. October 6th at the Robin Theater in Lansing, Michigan. October 7th, I'm going to be opening for Ron Placone and Graham Elwood in Cleveland. On October 8th, I'm going to be at Trixie's in Detroit, Michigan. And there's a bunch more shows that are going to be added pretty soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. The best place to go get ticket information and uh, updates on brand new tour dates is right on my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, while you're there checking out some tour dates, you can also check out my stand-up comedy albums, which most of them are available for, for free or for a very, very low cost. Uh, you can also make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. Make monthly contributions to help out uh, this show, um, my other show, uh, Forkful of Noodles, my live streams, Road Reflections, and to help with touring and comedy journalism. Uh, sustaining members also get bonus stand-up comedy content and storytelling content, and they get free tickets to these 
shows. So if you are if you are somebody that is a sustaining member, then you don't have to pay for tickets when I come through your town because you're a sustaining member. So that's a, a fun little bonus thing uh, to add there. So again, uh, for all these dates, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com. Very excited to be hitting the road again. Uh, and thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching this thing.